Folks, it is good to see you all in God's house again this Lord's Day. We welcome you in the Savior's precious name. And we're going to uh, open our service by singing a lovely hymn. It's hymn number 313 in the hymn book. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. 313, and we'll all stand while we sing. Let us all unite our hearts in a wee word of prayer as we come before the Lord today. Let us pray that the Lord will come and meet with us. As we come to pray, we want to sympathize with our brother Jonathan Morrow. Johnny lost his grandmother this week, Mrs. Benison. And Mrs. Benison, for many, many years, went to her congregation in the Martyrs Memorial. Uh, we want to sympathize with Johnny and the family, the Benison family, at this time. And we want to remember them in our opening prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bow again in thy presence today. On this Remembrance Day, we thank thee, Lord, that we can bow humbly and reverently before thee. And, O oh God, we come before thee and we thank thee, Lord, for our blessed Savior, the one who laid down his life a ransom for the many the one who shed his precious blood for our sins. And, O oh God, we do pray for the Morrow family today, and we pray for the Benison home. We ask the Lord that you would comfort them. We thank the Lord that our dear sister Mrs. Benison is with Christ today, which is far better. 
But Lord, we do ask Thee that You would sustain the family and comfort them in these days. We do thank Thee, Lord, and praise Thee for the one who died, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And, O oh God, as we would remember Thy death in Thine appointed way, around the Lord's table this morning, we pray, Heavenly Father, that You would draw us all closer to Thyself. We thank Thee for our blessed Redeemer, who died the just for the unjust, laying down His life in order to purchase our redemption. O oh God, we pray that even as we would meditate upon the death of Christ today, that you would come, Lord, and, Lord, speak to all of our hearts. We thank thee, Lord, for so many here this morning who can read their title clear to mansions in the sky. For that day, Lord, when you saved us, we are so thankful, Lord, that we're heaven-bound, and we praise thee, Lord, that we have been redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, the hymn writer penned it well when he wrote those words, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And, o God, we pray as we would meditate upon thy word this day, Lord, that all hearts would be touched and challenged. We pray for those in our congregation who are still strangers to grace and to God. Lord, that even this Lord's, this Lord's day that they would come and seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. We thank thee for the mission this week, Lord, out in a hurry. We pray, Lord, you'll bless there tonight as well, and this week again, that you would draw many in under the sound of thy precious word. And, O oh God, at this time of visitation, men and women will be wise and seek the Lord while he may be found. And, O oh God, call upon him while he is near. We thank thee, Lord, that you're still in the soul-saving business. We pray, Lord, today that this week, Lord, that you would reach down, save precious souls, and Lord, we'll give to thee all the praise. Bless us now, Lord, as we continue our morning worship service. Come and abide with us. In our Savior's name, we ask it. Amen. Amen. That's good singing. I'm going to sing a second hymn, 330 in the hymn book, Since Christ my soul from sin set free, this world has been a heaven to me amid our sorrows and its woe. This heaven, my Jesus, here to know. We'll stand again while we sing.
Our scripture reading this morning is found from Genesis chapter 22. Please turn to this tremendous, familiar chapter of God's Word, Genesis 22. And we're going to commence our reading at the verse 1. And we'll read down to verse 14 of this chapter. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, or test Abraham, that's what the word really means, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abram rose early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abram lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abram said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, saying, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abram built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou any thing unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abram went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abram called the name of the place Jehovah-Jarrah, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Amen. We end our reading there at verse 14, knowing the Lord will bless the reading of his word, his precious word to all of our hearts. Let me again welcome everyone along to the service today, and if you're visiting, we give you a very warm welcome, and those that are tuning online, we welcome you as well. Just a few announcements very, very quickly. Remember that after this service this morning, we are observing the Lord's table, and of course, the Lord's table, as we announce every month, is for the Lord's people. So if you're saved and love the Lord, the Lord invites you, indeed commands you, do this in remembrance of of me. So let us on this Remembrance Day remember the Lord and remember Him around His table. Tonight the Gospel Rally will be at 6.30 p.m. here in the church, and we'll be having our special Remembrance Service this evening and the wreath-laying service this evening as well. So please, please take note of that and come out again uh, to the service and bring your friends and your family with your sister Rebecca Little will be singing tonight is the time of prayer at 6 p.m. do please remember the special meeting tonight gospel mission continues tonight in a hoary orange hall at 8 p.m. and the reverend Fred Greenfield will be preaching at the gospel mission tonight we've really enjoyed the mission this week and I'd like to thank all of those who were able to come we have another week from Monday right through to Friday night. The mission ends on Friday night. If you haven't been yet then, please make a, make a plan to come along this week. And please continue to pray. Pray for the meetings that the Lord will bless the mission this week again. On Wednesday morning, the little treasures at 10 a.m. 
And also on Wednesday, the senior citizens' lunch at 12.30 p.m. Do all the senior citizens remember that, please? You're very welcome to come along to that special senior citizens' lunch on Wednesday afternoon. Then, uh, Friday night, the children's meeting and the children's meeting plus at 7 p.m. Youth fellowship at 8 p.m. And also remember in connection with the youth fellowship, on Saturday the 26th of November, they're having a craft fair and coffee morning from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Let me just announce again, anyone who has made crafts for the crafts fair, please leave them in the minor hall after the meeting this morning and Claire will be there to receive them, and also she'll be there next Sunday morning to receive them as well. Next Lord's Day, the Sunday school and the Bible class at a quarter past ten. The service is 11.30 and 6.30 p.m., and the singer next Sunday night will be Sarah McMullen, and the preacher at both services next Lord's Day will be the Reverend Baxter. Do please pray for us. We've been asked to go and preach at a mission down in Petticoat, on the border between Fermanagh and Donegal. Pray that the Lord will bless that mission. A mission started the same day as our own mission, and would ask you to pray for that mission, please, that the Lord will bless even down in that part of the vineyard. Remember also the family night, Sunday the 27th of November, the special family night service, uh, the last Sunday evening of this month at 6.30 p.m., and our sister, Mrs. Chrismer Baxter, will be along to give her testimony that night. And the Reverend and Mrs. Baxter will be both singing that evening. Reverend Morris Baxter and his wife will be singing. Just to draw your attention to that, and there'll be supper for everyone at that special meeting. The Let the Bible uh, Speak calendars have arrived for 2023. Now, this is a special edition of the calendar marking 50th, the 50th anniversary of the Let the Bible Speak. The price for this special edition is five pounds, and if you'd like one, you can take them. I think they should be on the vestibule and the tables as you leave the church today. There's a list there as well. Just put your name down that you've taken one, and well, uh, we can get uh, that money off you later, but do please remember that please this special edition, and we want to emphasize it, and we want as many folk to get it as possible. Now, I think that's all the announcements. Just to say that the Vision magazines have arrived as well, and you can get your copy of the Vision magazine as you leave the church uh, today. Now, we're going to keep our seats, and we're going to sing another hymn as the offering is being taken up. It's hymn number 335, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. There's a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. We'll just keep our seats as the offering is being taken up.
Please turn again in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And with God's Word open before us at this portion of Scripture, we'll bow in prayer and ask the Lord for His help as we come to consider God's Word today. We're delighted to be able to say that around the Lord's table today we're receiving in some new members. And it's always a joy and a privilege to receive in new members. And we do pray that the Lord will bless us in a few moments' time when we come to partake of the Lord's table. And let me emphasize it again, dear child of God, the Lord commands us, do this in remembrance of me. This, of course, is Remembrance Sunday, and we remember those who laid down their lives in the cause of freedom, and we'll be having our special remembrance service this evening. But let us not forget about the one who laid down his life for ransom for his people, the blessed Savior. And let us wait behind today and thank the Lord for his death upon the cross of Calvary. Let's bow in a wee word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank Thee and we praise Thee for all Thy mercies to us. And Lord, we thank Thee for dying the just for the unjust, that You might bring us to God. Lord, we're heaven-bound, and our sins are forgiven because of the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made on the cross. And O oh God, as we come to consider that sacrifice just now, through the Word of God, we pray that You would speak to all of our hearts, that You would bless and encourage Your saints, and those, Lord, who are not saved, that You would reveal to them Your great love for them in dying, shedding Your precious blood in order to redeem them. O oh God, fill us now with Thy gracious Holy Spirit. And help us, Lord, only to say those things that will be pleasing to Thee. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Abraham, throughout his life, was tested many times by God. In Genesis chapter 12, he was called to separate himself from his native land. In Genesis chapter 13 and chapter 21, he had to cast out Ishmael and Hagar and separate from Lot. All these events were times of testing for Abraham, the man of God. And although they were not easy decisions to make, Abraham, by faith, always made the right decision, seeking at all times to do the will of God. In Genesis chapter 22, this very familiar chapter of God's Word, Abraham is being tested by God again. Only this time, it is the ultimate test. In this chapter, God commands Abraham to take his son, his only son Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Who could have condemned Abraham if he had wavered at this point? Yet the wonderful fact is this, Abraham's faith faltered not. Obeying the command of God, he took his only son Isaac, brought him up to the top of Mount Moriah, laid him upon the altar, and would have sacrificed him to God only for the intervention of the angel. You see, so much did Abraham love the Lord, and so much was his faith in God that he believed that even if his son had been killed, God would have raised him up from the dead because God had promised Abraham that in Isaac, his son, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Men and women, that is what it means to walk with God, to be so full of faith that you never doubt or question the will of God. Is it any wonder that the Bible describes Abraham as the father of the faithful. However, it is impossible to study and read this chapter in Genesis chapter 22 without considering the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, Abraham offering up his son Isaac is one of the many types and shadows of the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Here in Genesis chapter 22, we have an unparalleled foreshadowing of the crucifixion of God's only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
we have here in this chapter a tremendous picture of Calvary. And this morning, just before we sit around the Lord's table, very simply as we come to consider Genesis 22, I want to draw your attention to some parallels between the offering up of Isaac and the offering up of God's dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that the Lord will bless our hearts as we remember on this Remembrance Sunday morning the Lord's death for us upon the cross of Calvary. Oh, dear child of God, I pray again that our hearts will be warmed as we consider what it costs for Christ the Holy One to bear away our sins. And if you're in the meeting today in the service and you're not saved, my prayer is that the Lord will speak to your heart and reveal to you what the Lord Jesus Christ suffered on the middle tree on Golgotha's brow in order to purchase your salvation and redeem you for time and for eternity. First of all, I want you to notice the preparation that was made by Abraham. From verses 3 to 6, we have Abraham setting apart his son for the offering. As the Passover lamb was separated from the flock four days before it was killed, so Isaac was taken by his father Abraham three days before the sacrifice. Notice in these verses how carefully and minutely Abraham prepared the details. He acted as a hewer of wood. He prepared the fuel for the sacrifice. He carried the fire and the burnt and built the altar. Indeed, everything that was needed for the painful service of the sacrifice was provided by Abraham the father. I wonder, did you ever notice that? Also in verse 3, it reveals to us that the place of Isaac's sacrifice was known to Abraham. Abraham knew the location where he would offer up Isaac his son. Abraham knew the exact mountain on which Isaac would be offered upon. My, what careful preparation Abraham made as he sought to sacrifice his only son at the command of God. Look at verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering. Notice the detail. And rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him of. Then on the third day Abram lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abram said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand, look at the detail, and a knife, and they went both of them together. It's important that you see the preparation that Abraham made. And he's making this preparation, men and women, in order to sacrifice his only son upon Mount Moriah to God. And he does it faithfully, and he does it minutely, and he does it by faith, and he does it obeying the command of God. Men and women, the question could be asked, how long was God the Father in preparing Calvary? Do you ever think about that? The Word of God declares that the Savior was marked out for sacrifice from all eternity past. You see, Calvary was no afterthought or mistake by God. Man's sin was foreseen and provided by the Lord. God built into the plan of creation a plan of redemption. And long before God put the sun in the sky, He made provision for the fall of man. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, we read these words, "...the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world." In other words, before God created this world, before He put the stars in orbit, before He created this world in six literal 24-hour days, He had made provision for the fall of man. 
He had already put into operation the plan of our redemption. In Acts 2, verse 23, it tells us that the crucifixion of Christ was according to the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God. In other words, nothing surrounding the death of Christ happened by chance, but rather it was carefully executed and planned by the Father. God the Father planned and prepared His only begotten Son for Calvary before the world was created. When the Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy, he said this in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Listen to these words. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus, when? Before the world began. Therefore, as Abraham prepared his son for sacrifice, so too God the Father prepared His only begotten Son for sacrifice. What a glorious thought. So much did God love this world and love sinners in this world that He provided an eternal redemption, and that eternal redemption was, was going to cost Him His Son. And we'll say more about that sacrifice just in a moment. God made the wood for the cross. God made the steel for the nails. He made the thorns for the crowns. He made the very soldiers who crucified the Savior. Oh, what a plan the plan of redemption is. And dear child of God, as we are gathered in God's house today, and as we soon would gather around the Lord's table to remember His death and His appointed way, let us never forget the preparation that was made by the Father, the preparation that was made in order to purchase our eternal salvation. And today, as we leave God's house, may we leave God's house saying it was good to be here, for it was here where we met with the Lord, and it was here where we were, where we, where we were reminded again of that plan, that wonderful plan of redemption. We're heaven-bound because of it, and we're saved tonight because of that plan and that preparation that was made. Thank God our sins are forgiven and we'll never be in hell because of the preparation that was made in order for God to save a world of sin. But I want you to notice something else here. Take a look at Genesis chapter 22 again. I want you to notice not only the preparation that was made, but I want you to notice the parties that were present. Now, this is very important. Look at verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, look at the latter part of verse 6. And they, that was Abraham and Isaac, the father and the son, they went both of them together. Abraham and Isaac went alone up to the top of Mount Moriah. The servants were left behind. Abraham and Isaac went together. Now, it's important that you see that. And yet, although Abraham went up to the top of the mountain with Isaac, here's an important point. The time came when Abraham had to forsake his son. And that moment came when Abraham lifted the knife in order to slay his son. Oh, again, what a wonderful picture we have here of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ died on the cross, it was a transaction between the Father and the Son. No other parties were involved. The eternal covenant of redemption made between God the Father and God the Son in eternity past involved only two divine parties. Remember how the Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane took with Him the disciples. You'll remember reading that in the Bible. And yet the time came when the Lord Jesus had to go on alone. You see, there came a point in the life of Christ beyond which even the disciples could not go. And what agonizing communion there 
was in Gethsemane between who? Between the Father and the Son. A communion no one else could share. You remember what the Lord Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 32? He said this, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. You remember how they were scattered? But then Jesus said this, And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Underline the words, the Father is with me. From the stillness of Gethsemane's garden, the Father and the Son went together into the arms of the angry mob. The Father and the Son went together into Pilate's judgment hall with all the mocking and spitting and shame. The Father and the Son went together out into the streets of Jerusalem and up the side of Mount Calvary. The Father and the Son went together. And yet, there was a point in the proceedings when God the Father forsook His Son and lifted the knife of judgment and sacrificed His Son for our sins. That is why the Lord Jesus Christ cried out, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? But you can see here how accurate the type is in Genesis chapter 22. As Abraham told his servants to wait at the bottom of the mount, that Abraham and Isaac would go up the mount together. My friend, when the Lord Jesus bore our hell in his own body upon the tree, it was a transaction between the Father and the Son. And yet, as we've already emphasized there, there was a point when the Father on Calvary had to forsake his Son. He had to look away from his Son that was the time in those three hours of darkness when God the Father took the sword of judgment and plunged it into His only begotten Son. That was the time that the Savior bore our hell in His own body upon the tree. And of course, that had to happen in order for the Lord Jesus to bear away our sin. And dear child of God, as we gather around the Lord's table very soon, and to remember his death, let us remember that the Lord Jesus died for our sins and he paid the price for our redemption. But the Father, even, even the Father, had to forsake him when the sword of judgment fell upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's an interesting thought here, and it must not go unmentioned. All throughout Abraham's life. Now, if you've studied Abraham's life, and I'm sure many of you have, you will know that throughout Abraham's life, the life story of Sarah is interwoven with the life of Abraham, Sarah being his wife. In other words, no matter where Abraham is found, Sarah is always at his side or looking over his shoulder. But it's interesting to note this, that in Genesis chapter 22, Sarah is never mentioned once. Do you ever notice that? She's nowhere to be seen. Sarah is out of the picture completely in Genesis chapter 22. You know, the papacy has for many years tried to make Mary co-redemptive with Christ. In other words, the Church of Rome has sought to teach that Mary's part in redemption was just as important as Christ's part. That's the official teaching of the Church of Rome. Friend, could I say this morning that Mary had no part in man's eternal redemption because the Word of God plainly and clearly teaches that the only parties involved were the Father and the Son. Mary was only the instrument used by God to bring Christ into this world. But as far as God's redemption was concerned, she had absolutely nothing to do with it. Because there's only one Savior, and there's only one Redeemer. And that one Savior and that one Redeemer, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, when the Lord Jesus died upon the cross in those three hours of darkness... Business was being done between the Father and the Son. 
Everyone else was blocked out of view. That's why the veil of darkness came down, so that in those three hours of darkness, no one could see God the Father plunging the sword of judgment into His only begotten Son. Oh, what a Savior. What a redemption. What a salvation. Dear child of God, is any wonder that the Savior says, do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget about this death that I have died. Don't forget about this redemption that I have provided. Don't forget to remember me around the table. There's something else, but I want you to notice here. Take a look at verse 2 of Genesis 22. I want you to notice thirdly the price that was demanded. Look what it says in verse 2. And he said, this is the Lord speaking to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. How Abraham loved Isaac. But God demanded that his servant Abraham was to offer the thing that he loved most as far as earthly possessions were concerned. Therefore, the test that Abraham was called to undergo cost him greatly because it was going to cost him his only begotten son. I want you to see that. It's important that you notice that. But not only was there a price to be paid by Abraham, the father, but there was also a price to be paid by Isaac, the son. Isaac was going to lose his life, and Isaac was prepared. And this is important. Isaac was prepared for that, because when his father placed him upon the altar, he willingly lay there to be sacrificed. Do you ever notice that? Look at verse 9. And they came to the place of which God had told them of, and Abram built an altar there and laid the wooden order and underline these verses. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Isaac made no resistance. Isaac uttered no complaint. You'd think a young man being tied up and laid upon the altar would have known exactly what was going to happen, and Isaac did. And you would have thought, naturally, he would have fought back but he didn't fight back. Oh, again, what a wonderful picture of Calvary we have here. Men and women, the price of our redemption was costly. Man's salvation cost God the Father, His only begotten Son. Romans 8 verse 32 says, God spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. How shall we ever know what Calvary cost the Father? As God the Father saw His only Son led like a lamb to the slaughter and nailed to the cross by ungodly men, then the Father Himself in those three hours of darkness when Christ was upon the cross, having to take the sword of judgment that demanded payment for our sins and plunge it into the bosom of His only begotten. I tell you, men and women, there is no chapter in the Old Testament that shows us more clearly what Calvary meant to the Father than Genesis chapter 22, because the Father gave the very darling of His bosom when He gave His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die upon the cross for our sins and for our iniquities. Then, of course, there was the price that God the Son paid for man's redemption. Like Isaac, the Lord Jesus was obedient unto his Father's will. Indeed, the Bible says that Christ was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He went willingly to Calvary and died painfully for the sins of his people. There's a tremendous text, and I know that many of you know it so well, it's found in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7. But it sums up, it sums up wonderfully the cost that our redemption, that our redemption cost the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 7 of Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, 
so he openeth not his mouth. Oh, how the Lord Jesus loved you and I when he willingly went to the middle tree on Golgotha's brow. Oh, what it cost the Father, but what it cost the Son. It cost the Son his life. And upon that middle tree, he loved us so much. He loved us so much that there he died, the just for the unjust. There he laid down his life, paying the ultimate sacrifice in order to purchase our salvation and our redemption. Oh, I tell you, none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed or how dark was the night that the Lord passed through or he won the souls that was lost. We'll never understand it and we'll never take it in what it cost for Christ the Holy One to bear away our sins. But oh, dear child of God, again, as we meet around the Lord's table in a few moments' time, let us, let us remember the pain and the agony and the suffering that the Son of God went through in order to purchase our salvation and our redemption. Maybe you're in the meeting today and you're not saved. You're not born again of the Spirit of God. Oh, my friend, if the cross does not melt your heart, then nothing will melt your heart. If by viewing Calvary's middle tree and seeing what the cross cost the Son of God, in order to save your soul. If, it, if that doesn't soften your heart, then nothing will soften your heart. Oh, I pray today that you will get a fresh glimpse of Calvary. And even as you consider the love of God to you and the love of Christ to you in the wonderful plan of salvation and redemption, that you will come and by faith put your trust in the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. But there's something else I want you to notice just before we finish. This is very interesting. Not only the preparation that was made and the parties that were present and the price that was uh, demanded, but I want you to notice, fourthly, the picture of the resurrection. Did you ever notice the picture of the resurrection that we have in Genesis chapter 22? You know, Genesis, 20, 20, Genesis 22 presents to us in type not only Christ offered uh, offering upon the altar, but Christ's resurrection. Verse 4 tells us that it was on the third day that Abraham received Isaac back again. Look at verse 4. It says, And on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now, what do I mean that verse 4 tells us that it's the third day that Abraham received Isaac back again. Well, simply this. During the three days that elapsed from the time that Abraham received the command from God to offer Isaac as a burnt sacrifice, Isaac was to Abraham as good as dead. As soon as God commanded Abraham, take your son and sacrifice him, sacrifice him on Mount Moriah, as far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was dead. Isaac was going to sacrifice him. He was literally going to sacrifice Isaac. So from the, he received the command until that moment on Mount Moriah, three days later, when God intervened, as far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was dead. I believe that Abraham was mourning for his son. From that time, Abraham received the command until the time Abraham lifted the knife to slay Isaac. The lad was as good as dead as far as Abraham was concerned. But the very moment, listen to this, the very moment that the angel spoke from heaven and said to Abraham, lay not thy hand upon the lad. Abraham knew at that moment that Isaac was delivered from the grave. In the mind and heart of Abraham, it was as if his son was being resurrected from the dead. Oh, what a parallel we can see here. The parallel can be seen clearly, I believe. Thank God not only has Christ died an atoning death on the cross for his people, but he has risen again. The third day he has 
He rose again. We're all familiar with Matthew's gospel, chapter 28 and verse 6. He is not here, the angel said, for he has risen as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Well, thank God today we don't serve a dead Savior, one on a cross or in a tomb, but we serve one who has risen again and one who is alive forevermore. And thank God, because He lives, we can live also. Isn't that a tremendous blessing today, dear child of God, as we're gathered in God's house, worshiping the Lord, just about to partake of these emblems that remind us of the body that was broken and the blood that was shed, as we re remember the death of our blessed Savior. Isn't it wonderful to know that He's alive and that this very moment he is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for his people. We serve a living Savior. We serve one who has risen from the grave. Oh, my friend, I wonder at the close of our meeting today, just before God's people, remember the Lord's death and his appointed way. How is it with your soul? How is it with your soul? Are you ready for the mansions above? Do you know anything personally about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Is He real in your life? Is He your Savior and your Redeemer? Oh, my friend, if He's not, my prayer is, even this morning, that you will come and put your faith and trust in the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He's coming back again, and I believe He's coming back again very soon. What a day that's going to be. And when he comes again, he will bear the marks of our redemption in his hands, in his feet, and in his side. We will be able to identify our Savior very clearly. Oh, isn't it wonderful? My friend, if you're not ready, if you're not prepared, then make preparation this day and come and trust Christ as your Savior. Let's all bow in a wee word of prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for this wonderful chapter in God's Word. We thank Thee, Lord, for this wonderful picture of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. O oh God, we pray that as we gather around the Lord's table in a few moments' time that You would draw us all closer to Thyself. Those of us who are saved, Lord, we thank Thee. And we praise Thee for laying down Your life in order to save us from our sins and save us from the consequences of our sins, which is hell forever. O oh God, we praise Thee for the wonderful redemption that is found in Jesus Christ alone. And Lord, we do pray that for those in our service this morning who have not trusted Thee as their Savior, that even this day, Lord, that they would come and turn from their sin, and seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. O oh God, as they have considered the wonderful redemption that Christ has provided for them upon the cross, that they might call upon thee this day, and find eternal redemption through the blood of the Lamb. So bless us now, Lord, those who have to leave, we pray that You'll give them journeying mercies. And, O oh God, those of us who remain, we pray that you'll draw us closer to thyself as we remember the Lord's death and his appointed way. For us in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Folks, I'll not go to the door. So those who are leaving, free to leave. And God bless you.